Hey, good evening, everyone. How are we doing out there? And how's everyone out in uh, Facebook and YouTube land? We're happy to be with you tonight for uh, Wednesday night prayer and Bible study time. And uh, it's been a great week. We had some rain today. It's really good. We needed it, so that's good. We are um, happy to be together with the saints that are gathered, happy to be connected to the saints that aren't gathered, and have this opportunity to pray together, to uh, lift up our requests to the Lord, and then to dive into God's Word and study the Bible. So I uh, just wanted to mention a couple of families um, this week that have suffered a loss. Um, my neighbors, Dave and Clarissa Merrill, they lost their uh, 22-year-old son this weekend in a, in a car accident. So let's remember Dave and Clarissa. Also, um, remember Patricia Hathaway in the loss of her mother. Uh, some of you probably knew her, Sylvia or June Hathaway. She passed away this morning. And then um, also Marvin Lowry, Tammy Dawson's dad, passed away last night. So let's remember these families that are grieving loss. And some of them are probably on the prayer request sheet. So what we're going to do is tonight, we're going to go ahead and we're going to, instead of just reading these and then rereading them to the Lord, we're just going to go ahead and read these requests as we pray tonight for them. So if you would bow your heads with us. Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up tonight um, Lorena McQueen's uh, co-worker's 17-year-old daughter who had surgery to remove her thyroid. We pray that the medication um, increases to the appropriate levels and that her body will begin producing adequate calcium as her uh, parathyroids resume function. Lord, we just ask for your healing in this young lady's life and, God, that your power would work mightily in her. Lord, we just lift up to you uh, the Hathaway family as, they, as Patricia grieves the loss of her mother and Lord, I pray that you bring comfort to those affected by this loss. Lord, we thank you for um, the awesome, happy, fun life that uh, Sylvia had when she was alive, God, and all the, all the great memories I heard about of her growing up. And Lord, I thank you that she had a nice, full life of 91 years and that she is now in heaven with you. God, I thank you for salvation that made that possible. Lord, we uh, also request prayer for uh, Tammy Dawson and her family in the loss of Marvin Lowry. And uh, God, we know that it's, it's just hard to lose people that you love. And Marvin was a faithful servant of yours, a faithful preacher of the gospel. Lord, we thank you that he's now promoted to glory and that he is receiving the crowns that, that he has earned through his faithful service to you. Heavenly Father, we continue as we go down this list just offering our praises to you and and we come before you also uh, just with more requests God the things that are on our minds the things that are on our hearts tonight God we uh, continue to pray for uh, Debbie Harden as uh, she can uh, had her surgery yesterday and it sounds like everything went good and so we continue to pray for her and Pastor Tim uh, as she uh, recovers and God, we're just thankful for uh, just uh, the surgery and everything going well. Uh, God, I do want to pray for the women's simulcast that is coming up on this Saturday. Lord God, I just pray that uh, it would be a sweet time of fellowship, uh, of learning your word, of coming together as believing women. And God, just uh, you would just unite them uh, with the, the vision of, of reach, reaching women for Christ. Uh, God, I just pray, Lord, uh, for all of those who have put in the efforts uh, to get this group together on, on Saturday. And, uh, Lord God, if there's any other uh, ladies out there that want to join in uh, as of tonight, God, that they would get signed up. And, and God, that it, you would just bless their time together. Uh, God, I do pray um, for my son, uh, Noah. Um, he's having sh shoulder surgery uh, coming up in about a week. And Lord God, I just pray that you'd bring healing to his shoulder. And then he's going to be going off to school. And I just ask a prayer for myself and Christy as we drive him up to Pennsylvania. And God, that he would get acclimated and uh, just adjust very well to his uh, new school surroundings. Uh, God, I also pray for all the high school graduates who are going to be going off in the next couple of weeks. They're going to be going off to school. They're going to be starting school. Um, you got some that are going in the military. Lord God, I just 
during this just chaotic, uh, just uncertain times, that you would be with them, guide them every step of the way, and more than anything, God, that they would rely on their grounding in you, their foundation, uh, that their parents, that our youth ministry, that people in the church and, and those who love Jesus have put into their lives, and that they would just uh, stay strong with that, God. Uh, God, I do pray for our friend David Staples. Um, his father, uh, Robert Staples, has been in the hospital the last couple of days undergoing tests, trying to figure out uh, what has been going on uh, with a lot of unpleasantness um, and pain. And so, God, I just pray that you would be with him as uh, they continue to figure out what is going on. God, I do pray uh, for the pastor search team, as, uh, as Lynn Phillips requested that uh, they would rely on God's timetable uh, throughout all this. And, and Lord God, I just pray that uh, as they meet together, as they pray, Lord, that uh, you would make your will absolutely perfect to them. God, we're just so thankful that we can get together as the church to study, whether it's in person, whether it's watching online. And God, I just ask that you would bless this time of learning and teaching. It's in Jesus' name. Lord, we come before you tonight realizing that you are a God of might and God of power. And uh, Lord, we uh, know that you can work your good for all in each and one of these situations. So Lord, we uh, lift up these folks to you tonight. We continue as we, we pray for Cheryl Francis' uh, sister, Shirley Sweet. She's had uh, seemingly a, a miraculous uh, recovery uh, some months ago in a wheelchair with cancer and, and now through uh, medication and through your healing is able to uh, be up and around working in her garden and uh, the doctors are astounded and we know that uh, you have been a part of this process to bring healing to her life and Lord we just pray that the doctors will continue to be astounded as she makes this recovery. Lord we uh, also pray for Kathy Van Nordstrom's request for Ed Davis Lord, he's a great saint of yours and has been uh, a great uh, influence in, in this church, through this church family. We pray for his continued healing and pray that you might continue to use him in ministry uh, if it would be your will. We pray uh, for recovery from the stroke uh, and uh, pray that you might work in his life and be with the family that as they support him in this. We pray for Kathy's son, Corey, who's going to be having surgery tomorrow. Pray for the success of that surgery, that you might uh, guide the surgeon's hand, and that the recovery might be uh, well done. We pray for Nellie Kreese and Thelma Pomeroy as they're experiencing uh, plumbing issues in their home. Lord, we pray that there might be a resolution of this and that uh, uh, those who can take care of it might be secured and uh, render a fast uh, uh, fixing of the problem that they fa they're, they're facing there. We pray for Richard Jackson's mother, Joan, who is, fell and uh, broke her hip. Lord, we pray for uh, her recovery and for the surgical procedure that will be necessary to mend that hip. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will be in this process and be with the family as they support her as well in this. Uh, we pray for Marilyn Gortney as uh, she recovers from surgery on her neck. Pray that the healing will be complete and that uh, she will be able to uh, magnify and honor you because of, of that healing. Again, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to come together tonight to study your word because we know that through the realization of your truth in our lives, that our lives can be different. And Lord, we know that uh, as we go from here, we pray that we might implement those truths and that we might be encouraged and that we might see the wisdom of all that you bring to our lives. Thank you for your presence and our opportunity here we have to share together. This we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. And we had one more come in. Uh, Lord God, we pray for Anita Rousseau. Um, she's requesting uh, prayer for her sister, Helen, as she's about to undergo a second back fusion surgery uh, later this week. God, we just pray for a successful surgery. Uh, we pray ultimately for pain relief, and God, that you would be glorified through it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, all right, so y'all know what book we're in? John, all right, making sure you guys are awake. 
We are still in the book of John, and we're uh, traveling through it. It's been a long journey. Uh, when, when did Ralph start, John? Was it in the beginning of the year? So we're like, I don't know, halfway through maybe? Yeah, I think we're about, half, I yeah. think we're about halfway through. We're getting there. We're getting there. So uh, excited to uh, jump in tonight. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting in chapter 12, and we're going to be in verse 37. So our goal tonight is to finish chapter 12. And so we will pick up there. Uh, looking back at just like some of the context of where we're at to maybe catch some people up uh, where we are going to be, um, we've just had the triumphal entry. So obviously one of the most, uh, I think, famous scenes that we see in all of Scripture of Jesus riding in on the donkey. And of course, you know, you've got all these people who are just... Uh, pronouncing him basically as king, as, as Hosanna, the blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And I mean, there's so much excitement as we look for this, uh, you know, this, this point that was uh, foreseen in so long ago in the Old Testament, and it's coming to fruition now. And so here, here he comes, and now we, last uh, couple of weeks, we talked about Jesus predicting his crucifixion, and we went much into depth about that. And so now we are getting to the point of Isaiah's prophecies fulfilled. Now, most of y'all know, if you go through the book of Isaiah, there's a lot of messianic prophecies throughout the book of Isaiah. So uh, we're going to jump in here in verse 37, and we're going to take this slowly because there's going to be a lot of jumping back and forth, I think, tonight between what we're going to be reading and some of the Old Testament prophecies. So uh, if you have your Bible, you're going to definitely want to, you know, uh, keep your finger in John as we jump back and forth. And if you have a phone app, uh, excellent. Uh, you'll be able to do it even faster. So here we go. Verse 37 of chapter 12. Even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet who said, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And I want to go ahead and stop there. Now, where have we seen this over the last several weeks? Once again, they did not believe him. You guys want to jump in? Well, yeah, and where we left off last week was... You know, we, we stumbled upon the fact that the teachers ha are not telling the people about all of the prophecies, right? They were only telling about the popular messianic prophecies. And so Jesus is shifting gears and saying, all right, let's talk about some of the ones that the other guys are leaving out, okay? Let's go to Isaiah. Let's look at the prophecies that really talk about me, that give you a complete picture of who Messiah is. And you know, that's, that's where we jump in tonight. And here's Jesus, once again, like you said, just a few verses earlier, there's angelic voices confirming who he is. He's performed signs and wonders, so there's no reason not to believe that he's the Messiah, yet these people are so stubborn and so slow to hear that even with all they've seen and heard, they're still ready to reject him. You know, as we, as we look here... You know, in the Gospel of John, there's only six or half a dozen or so signs or miracles that Jesus did uh, as far as. And so I think John here is not only referring to the signs and miracles that he did in his Gospel, but he's also referring to uh, the other Gospels, which were also circulating at that time. And, uh, you know, the people were so uh, enamored with their own agenda. Uh, and with their own ideas of what they wanted in Messiah, that they could not see the truth. Even though they saw it, they would not act on it because they are zeroed in on what they want to happen and what they feel like should be the proper uh, Messiah uh, to, uh, for them. Right. They're still looking for that conqueror. They're still looking for the, the one to conquer Rome and uh, to basically be the warrior king, you know, and they're still looking for those things. Now, I think another thing we're going to see here is another reason why, why they did not believe. So when we see these words, when it says they've seen the signs, um, 
they've been in his presence and yet they did not believe in him well part of this unbelief is the fulfillment of prophecy and i'm not you know those two are very much correlated because god is in charge god is sovereign and so the two have to be connected now let's talk about what unbelief means i mean there's a difference between someone who comes and says you know well i'm thinking about this jesus thing you know i haven't decided i'm a little indifferent right now versus someone who says I do not believe. Think about the conscious effort of saying I don't believe. That means you've weighed the cost, you've thought it through, and you've rejected Jesus. I mean, there's a big difference there. And so when we say, I mean, these are people who basically, they have rejected Jesus. And like everything Tim just said, all these things that they have seen, all those, you know, the, the, the prophecies that Mark was talking about, you know, they were very selective in the ones that they talked about and they looked at. And so when it gets down and they're reiterating parts from Isaiah here, Lord who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, it goes on in verse 39, this is why they were un unable to believe because Isaiah also said, he has blinded their eyes, he's hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Now, I want to spend some time here. So, um, guys, as you guys are looking at this, um, I don't know if you had a chance to kind of dive back into Isaiah today and look at some of this prophecy, but... Um, we see several times in scripture where God has hardened the hearts of people. And Jordan and I were having a conversation earlier today, uh, and this is like one of those big, you know, open a can of worms kind of a thing, you know, and it's like, all right, I'm going to tread very safely here. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will talk about, um, for example, you know, the, the fact that we are all born into sin, right? So apart from Jesus and his work on the cross, um, we're, we're, we're in trouble. You know, we are in trouble. We cannot save ourselves. It is only Jesus who saves us. And so, you know, a lot of people will use that word total depravity, meaning that we are completely depraved from the moment we are born. We are born into sin, and our sentence is death. Now we, we need Jesus. Jesus is the one who is going to save us from here. And so there's this, you know, several passages in Scripture that talk about uh, God creating what they call objects of wrath. And, and like I said, this is a kind of a touchy subject when you talk about someone being created as an object of wrath. Because now if we completely believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is in control, God does what he wants, um, you know, he's got a reason for everything. Everything he does, he has a reason for. And so the big question, I'll leave it with you guys, why would God harden the heart of anybody? Well, I think there's a couple of different ways to look at that because God knew that Pharaoh didn't want to let the Israelites go. And, and the scripture says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God already knew that Pharaoh wasn't going to have a soft heart. So I don't believe that God intervened from taking Pharaoh from being this really nice guy who wanted to give the Israelites parting gifts to hardening his heart and not letting them go. God in his sovereignty knew, sure. and God in his sovereignty knew that these people were not going to pay attention. They were not going to listen. They were going to harden their hearts, and he, he allowed them and maybe even interfered a little bit, because we know God can do that. I mean, think about um, the Emmaus Road in Luke, where the disciples are sad, and they're walking, they're walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and Jesus walks up. And starts walking with them and says, hey, guys, why are you so sad? And they're like, oh, man, are you a stranger? Like, you don't even know what's going on around here, do you? And Jesus just plays dumb. And, and he, he listens to them whine and complain. And then he says, the scripture says that he explains to them from the prophets all of the reasons that Messiah would suffer. Right? They couldn't see it. They just couldn't see it. And, and the scripture says that their eyes were, were held where they couldn't see it. So I think that God will allow a person who's absolutely got their mind made up, he will allow them to stay in a mental fog. He will cause a mental fog that, that maybe even takes them from where they are and how they feel about it, you know, to even maybe a, a more obstinate stance. I believe there's a line that's drawn here. And uh, 
we can approach that line and, and go over that line and become so committed to evil, so committed to oppose God in whatever stance they take that he, um, at that point, hardens your heart. He, so we, you know, it's not that God is hardening uh, our hearts for any particular, on a whim, but he's hardening our hearts because we have crossed the line and we have gone so far against God that he has put that upon us that there's a point of no return. Yeah, that's when, good. when we look in the book of Romans and, you know, something that, um, you, you know, I guess you always have to, to talk about when we're talking about depravity, when we're talking about um, people who are, you know, hardening their own hearts or whether God is hardening their hearts. Um, when we look in chapter one, um, I'm going to jump in in verse 18 here. Uh, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. And as a result, people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. And instead, their thinking became worthless, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiping served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forevermore. Amen. And, and I think what we see here is kind of what you guys are talking about. You know, they get to that, you know, God, God just gives them over to him and say, hey, if this is what you want, have at it. And like you said, that line has been crossed um, and, and, you know, we see God hardening the hearts of people. And, you know, kind of going back to when, you know, these prophecies were written in the book of Isaiah, um, these things had to come to pass. I mean, they, they had to, right? For the consistency of God, um, that, that we know that he is, he is truthful throughout all ages. And so the fact that they were spoken and they were fulfilled in Jesus here uh, lends credit to, obviously, the, the, the scripture writers, but more importantly, uh, God Almighty, who wrote it and it came to pass. So, um, There's another reference to, and I think it was Paul that said this, uh, but he refers to people's conscience being seared as if with a hot iron, that, you know, when you sin against your conscience, when you go across that line, when you obstinately hold to what you think to be true when it's not, that there's a point where, like, you even sin against your own mind and you sear your own conscience. And uh, that's, that's probably where a lot of these people were. Uh, going even to another passage in Isaiah here, I want to jump into Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to jump in at verse 8. Uh, we see the Isaiah's call and mission here in the, the famous passage that begins in the year King Uzziah died. And in verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. And he replied, go, say to these people, keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive Make the minds of these people dull, deafen their ears, and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and their ears, uh, and hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back, and be healed. And I thought that's, you know, again, as we were looking at this, it's kind of an interesting command of God, you know, that, that he's given them. So, again, people who have been turned over to their depraved minds, again, a way that God is hardening their hearts here. Um, Mark, you want to jump in verse 41? Before we leave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before we leave. Uh, the same, uh, you know, Isaiah, as you just read that passage there, experienced the rejection of the people to the God's message. This is, parallels the same thing that Christ experienced as he proclaims God's message. He is also rejected. And, of course, Isaiah saw and experienced this, and he, then he prophesied this, that this too would be a part of the Messiah's um, a lot that his message would be rejected in great part by uh, those who heard it. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, verse 41 goes to that 
Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke about him. You know, back to the Isaiah chapter 6 passage where he fell down before the Lord when he saw the Lord in all of his glory. That had to be, you know, a profoundly life-changing experience for Isaiah to see God in all of his glory. And, you know, he spoke that prophecy out of that relationship with God. Out of that experience came that prophecy that we're talking about. So this is not maybe a wise old sage sitting up on a mountaintop thinking good thoughts about God and writing something down. This prophecy came out of a direct experience with God, unlike maybe any other man ever had. You know, it was, it was incredible. Verse 42, nevertheless, I love this. Many did believe in him, even among the rulers, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him so that they would not be banned from the synagogues. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. I love it that they believed. I'm going to throw out a question here for both of you. They believed, it says, mm -hmm. but did they believe into salvation? Or did they believe that uh, maybe this, he might be the Messiah? I actually looked that up today because I was questioning that myself because the people that, you know, if you read commentaries and, you know, you're thinking about, okay, so who's he talking about here, you know? Um, he's talking about people who believed um, even among the rulers. So, you know, whether it was the Sadducees, maybe, maybe it was some of the Pharisees, religious leaders. And so you think of the people that come to mind right off the bat. Um, you've got uh, uh, for Joseph of Arimathea, um, let's see, Nicodemus, um, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking of these guys who they always had these good intentions in scripture and you know they were always there but then when it says hey you know because of the pharisees they did not confess him so that they would not be banned from the synagogue for they loved human praise more than praise from god now i am not their judge so and thankfully i am not i would be a terrible judge <laughs> and, and so um Part of me, I guess the, the human side of me would say they're in trouble. Um, they're in trouble because we know that, it, you know, if you do not stand for God, why would he stand for you on that day of judgment? Um, now, you know, the nice part of me somewhere buried deep inside, you know, would say, oh, man, but God would show mercy and everything. But I'm not so sure. Well, based on based on this passage alone, I, w I would agree. I'm not so sure. And. Looking forward, you, one of the things you have to think about is, you know, how many of you came to faith in an instant? Like you never knew anything about God. You walked into a church building or into a crusade. Somebody preached the gospel and you came to faith just like that. Is there anybody in here like that? Okay. Most of us came to faith through a journey, right? We, we had baby steps toward God, maybe... Maybe someone invited us to church, and we came, and we heard a message, and we, that began to marinate in our minds. And over time, other influences. Uh, a guy I met uh, used to be a worship leader in Texas where I was. He was telling me about his salvation experience. And he was determined. His name is Habib. And Habib was determined that he was going to make a connection with God. So at the time... Habib was playing uh, keyboards for the Beach Boys. So he scheduled, the Beach Boys were on tour in Japan, and he scheduled time off to meet with the biggest Buddhist guru in Japan while the Beach Boys were on tour there because he wanted to find God. They got to Japan. He went there. It was the only two weeks of the year that the guy took off. He was gone, right? So no Buddhist guru. And he had several experiences like that. He said one day he was sitting in the mall parking lot, and he looked over at a van that was parked, and on the van it said, Jesus loves you. And he got out, and he walked into the mall, and he was walking through the mall, and a guy sitting on a bench looked up at him, made eye contact with him, and said, Jesus loves you. And so through many experiences, Habib finally came to faith in Christ through this journey, and I believe, that's a long way of saying, that 
this may have been the beginning of a journey to faith that maybe didn't even like really culminate until after the crucifixion, until after the resurrection. But definitely the seeds were planted here. And, you know, I believe many of these guys could have become even leaders in the early church. I would think of someone like Joseph of Arimathea. I mean, whose tomb was it, you know, that Jesus was, was put into? So here's a guy who stuck his neck out later on, you know, after the crucifixion, you know, when he didn't have to. So you got to begin to wonder. I mean, that's a good point. You know, maybe at some point something happened. Um, you know, I think the perception of, you know, a lot of people, especially religious leaders of during that time where they're like, okay, this guy's doing some cool stuff and everything. And, you know, we're kind of seeing it, but I'm not going to stick my neck out for him. I think that's what we see in our culture even today. Yeah. yeah. It's probably hard to, to know exactly how deep their belief ran and how, what the result was. And, of course, we are not judge. We don't know. Uh, certainly. But I want to point out uh, two other things in these verses here. Uh, the two fears that they faced. The first fear was that they would be put out of the synagogue. They were afraid of what might happen to them if they put their faith and in, in confess, believed in their heart and confessed with their mouth that Jesus was Lord. So that's a fear that uh, people have to face when they come to a point of belief. Am I going to be afraid of what's going to happen to me? If, uh, if I believe in Jesus, uh, is my family going to be out of sorts with me, you know, for instance? Uh, the second fear uh, would be uh, what they're going to lose. They're going to lose the praise of men because of their position. So sometimes uh, we become afraid of uh, what we might lose uh, as a result of our belief in Christ. So these are two fears that uh, a believer must face in his stand for Jesus. Exactly. Um, you know, looking at this whole passage before we jump into verse 44, you know, going back to, uh, you know, talking about uh, the fulfillment of the prophecies to God hardening the hearts of folks, uh, saw this story, and I thought it was it, it kind of fit into tonight, uh, about Benjamin Franklin. Right. So obviously Benjamin Franklin is not found in the scriptures, by the way. And uh, so we have Benjamin Franklin. And uh, you remember the old time uh, pastor, preacher, George Whitfield. And so, you know, these guys were good friends for like 30 something years. Right. And so obviously George is, is witnessing to him. He's writing letters nonstop to them when they're apart. Um, he was there for him. He prayed for him daily. And even towards the end of Benjamin Franklin's life, he said, you know, basically, I appreciate the effort, but I will not be converted. And he heard it. He knew it everything about it and stuff, and yet when you're not converted, when you are not um, on board, when you are an unbeliever, that means you are hostile towards God. And that was the sad thing, but yeah, I asked Jordan today, I said, you know, did George Whitfield, did he fail? No, he didn't fail. And that's the thing, and, and that's like an encouragement, I think, to all of us out there, that Whatever happens as far as someone coming to know Christ, neither shall we receive the glory for that or the blame for that. What it is is we are supposed to do exactly what God has called us to do and tell them about Jesus. Tell them about how he has changed our lives. Let God move in that person's heart. Let God change that person. It is God who does the saving. And so for George there, that was not his failure. It, it was honestly, if anything, it was his success because the glory went to God for everything he did for God's glory throughout that whole process of 30-something years witnessing to Benjamin Franklin. And so, I, again, as an encouragement to all of us, just because you tell somebody about Jesus and they reject him, that, that's not on you. You have done exactly what Jesus has asked you to do and leave it to God to change that person. And before we leave this verse, uh, we just have to note, 43, they loved praise from men more than praise from God, which wraps right back around to 34, where we were talking about the false teaching, the false teaching by omission, right? These guys only wanted to bring good news, right? So they, they were serious about it. You know, it hinted at it earlier 
when the people they were teaching didn't understand all of the prophecies about Messiah. And then in 43, it just comes right out and says that, hey, these guys love getting patted on the back. More by men than caring about what God says. This, uh, this passage that we've looked at here, verse, basically verses uh, 37 through 43, is an interjection by John uh, to explain why uh, Jesus was being rejected by so many. Um, so it's sort of an editorial insert uh, of his uh, view of why this was happening. And then this is followed, the section we're fixing to get into, there's a, a split opinion, so to speak, uh, as to if this section actually followed uh, the discourse that y'all looked at last week and as a summation of that, or perhaps it, it could be a summation of the entire message that he had in the Gospel of John. So these next verses are going to be a summary of sorts, uh, which closes out uh, the section that uh, the, ministry, the public ministry of Jesus. It ends there, and everything that starts in chapter 13 and following has to do with Jesus' instructions to the disciples and to his crucifixion and resurrection, of course. The last verse that Mark had just uh, talked about, too, for they love human praise more than praise from God, um, often reminds me of Galatians 1.10. Uh, when we look at Galatians 1.10, we see Paul writing to the church there, and he says, For am I now trying to persuade people or God, or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And, you know, you think about these people who they wanted to basically be looked at with human praise, you know, and it's think about it because I think the natural inclination of a lot of us is we want to be people pleasers, you know, we want to, we want people to like us, you know, and nobody just gets up in the morning and says, boy, how can I make people hate me today? You know, no, nobody does that. Um, but in, in looking at this, you know, we, we know that we are not people pleasers according to scripture, that we are supposed to be God pleasers, that, you know, we do things ultimately for an audience of one for his glory. And then we see because he has called us by grace to do good works. And, and so then he is working all around us and, and, and doing the things that we can never dream of. So we, we get, and as Pastor Tim said, um, a lot of your, uh, your Bibles might call this a summary of Jesus' mission. And I've, I've seen the same thing where, you know, there, there are several times where maybe this is the summary of everything he has been teaching, you know, to the public as he's been going along. Maybe it's, just, you know, just the culmination of, you know, this teaching uh, when he comes into Jerusalem on the donkey. And, and so we get to this. And Tim, you want to read that for us? Uh, go ahead and read it, and then we'll uh, break it down. Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. He's laying the gauntlet down, and if there is ever any confusion that Jesus didn't claim to be God, um, this would be a huge argument here, because everything that Jesus is crying out here, and, and you know, it, I mean, literally says, Jesus cried out, the one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him. Who sent me? So I think we're going to see a few things here that obviously equate Jesus and God. Uh, we see in verse 45, the one who sees me sees him who sent me, obviously pointing to God. Uh, jumping down to 49, for I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything I have said. 
And so there's just this invaluable connection here that, you know, we have to look at and we have to say, you know what, Jesus is laying it down here. And basically he's saying you cannot pursue a relationship with God apart from Jesus. Guess what? They're tied together. You cannot pursue a relationship with Jesus apart from his word. And so those are two things that we have to remember as we go throughout this passage. Mark, what do you see in here? Well, I see a throwback again now to John chapter 3 because he says the exact same thing about judgment that he says in John 3, 16 and 17. And, you know, so many believers, I think, feel like their position in the world is to judge their unsaved coworkers and neighbors when really our mission is to follow Jesus and complete his mission. Jesus didn't come into the world, he said in John 3, 6, or 3, 17, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Um, again, he says, I'm not here to judge the world. I didn't come to do that. The words that I have spoken will do that in the last day. The world will be judged, and it will be judged by my words. But that's not what's happening here, because right now my mission is to bring as many people to eternal life as possible. And as a church, that is our mission to share the life-giving message of the gospel and to invite people in to a relationship with Christ. Our job is not to let them know how sinful we think they are. In uh, verse 47, uh, when he says, if any uh, one hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has this as his judge, the word. And underline that, you know, if you have a Bible there, the word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. And this kind of, you know, going back to you cannot separate God, you cannot separate Jesus, and you cannot separate his word. I mean, think about how the, the, the very first verse in the book of John, how does it start? In the beginning was the what? Word. The word. And the word was and the word was with. And, and so, I mean, right from the very get-go, I mean, he's made it clear. He's, he, he talks about what the word is. And so he's saying, listen, it, it, like Mark just said, you know, he, he didn't come to the world to, you know, blast everybody. He didn't, you know, I mean, he, he obviously, um, the, the word is what convicts us. Think about it. You know, as you read God's word, as, as God's word penetrates your life, it's what convicts you. It's what brings change about in your life. And so it's so important to, 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 you know, as for believers ourselves, as we are going about, you know, as we are going, as we are on this journey, uh, we're not the ones to be judging. If, if Jesus says, hey, I'm not here to judge, the word's going to do that. Why would we ever think, how arrogant could we be if we think that we have the audacity to go around and judging everybody? Now, there's a big difference, and I want to ask you guys, what's the difference between judging and holding accountable? Well, as far as judging, I, I wanted to say this about, about this passage. You know, it's not, it, our job is to share the life-giving words of Christ, right? Yeah. Our job is, is not to judge and I believe judging is when you're, you're condemning people as guilty. And you know, if you think about it in the courtroom setting, the judge, when he says, that's it, gavel comes down, you're guilty, that's not our role. Letting people know that God loves them and he wants to have a relationship with them and that, that they need to come to Christ. The, the scriptures tell us, Jesus said himself, that I'll send the comforter, I'll send the Holy Spirit. And his job is to convince and convict people of sin and to let them know what's wrong in their life. So when we enter into human judgment and say, well, I'm going to tell you what sins are in your life and what you need to do about them, um, especially directed toward a lost person, we are saying, uh, well, I guess God can't do his job. You know, I guess, I guess the Holy Spirit's not capable of doing the judgment, so I, I, need, to, I need to step in here. You know, so it's, it's, it is very arrogant, like you said. Well, like Mark said, uh, <clears throat> when we look at judgment, judgment uh, offers the possibility of condemnation. Uh, but when we're talking about accountability, there's a whole different perspective there because we, 
in accountability, we are doing that because we love that person. We want them to, to be the best that they can be. We want them to let the Holy Spirit empower their lives and to be all that they can be for Christ. So the accountability is not, a, if it's done in a spirit of love, is not judgment or condemnation. But it's, uh, it's uh, to help that other individual uh, or even ourselves, because we need to hold ourselves accountable as well, to be all that we can be for Christ. And what is the key to accountability? You know, if we, we think real about it, you know, what is the key to accountability? I think love and relationship are the key. Okay, I think, yeah, I mean, love, relationship, and well, as, as a person on the other end of accountability, what's the key? Yeah, the desire to want to be held accountable. I mean, and that's the thing, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I can't just go up to Richard and say, I'm going to hold you accountable, you know, if he has no desire to be held accountable. You know, he's just going to feel, you know, judged, basically. But, you know, if we have a good relationship and, you know, we decide, hey, let's hold each other accountable for something, that's a whole different thing. When I was uh, at Florida State my freshman year after I accepted Christ, uh, I got involved in Baptist Collegiate Ministries up there and ended up meeting a guy who went to O'Galley High School, of all places, and and he was what we would call my fish group leader. And so there was four of us. And basically, they set it up for accountability. You know, your freshman year in college, you're at a party school called Florida State. And, you know, I mean, what else do you do? You party, right? And so, you know, you go to football games. And so I, I got actually involved in these campus ministries. And, and let me tell you, these guys, we held each other accountable. And it wasn't, you know, we weren't mean. We were just like, we were on each other as far as walking with the Lord. And, you know, that, that, that is missing so much in today's culture as far as people coming around. And, and I love, you know, the fact that, you know, we have couples in here, we have singles in here, uh, you know, we have our four ladies are, you know, always sitting together. And it, it's a fantastic thing. But think about it, you know, as a church body, can we do that in love? Are you open enough to if someone sees something in your life that you would be receptive to receive it in love, to say, you know what, you're right. You're not the one convicting me. The Holy Spirit is convicting me. God's word is convicting me, and I thank you for pointing that out in my life. All too often, as believers, we're, we're too quick to be defensive, and then we jump and we use the J word, right? We have maybe someone in our life trying to hold us accountable, and we say, well, don't judge me. The Bible says don't judge. And we have to understand there's a difference between judgment, condemnation, and accountability. And I had a guy come in one time for benevolence help. And he was sitting across, from, sitting across the desk from me. And I said, I said what, you know, what's going on? What do you need? He said, I can't pay my electric bill. I said, well, how much is it? It was $116. He said, I don't have any diapers for my baby. We need diapers. We need formula. And I said, okay. And the next... The next breath that I drew, I, I smelled cigarette smoke. And I said, hey, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, do you, do you smoke? And he said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And I said, well, how much do you smoke? And he said, well, about a pack a day. And I said, well, how much, how much do those cost? And he goes, well, it's about $6 a pack. And I'm like, well, six times seven, that's $42 a week. There's four weeks in a month. You know, we did the month. We, I, we, I wrote it all down. And I, I wrote down the total of what he had spent on cigarettes, and I put a line under it, and I subtracted the $116 electric bill from it. There was money left over. I said, is, how much is a pack of diapers? He said, it's about $20. So I wrote $20, subtracted that from it. How much is formula? Wrote it down. Got to the bottom line. He would have had a few dollars left over. And many people, many people would have stormed out of my office angrily at that point. And that man looked at me and he said, you know, Pastor, you're right. He said, you're right. He said, God's given me all the resources I need. I've just burned them up. I'm like, that's exactly right. But that's, that's loving accountability. Like, hey, let's look at it. Let's see. Like, you're struggling here. You're struggling here. And it's hurt. You have this habit. And it's hurting your wife. I got a thank you card from that guy's wife. That's probably the only time that's ever happened. And her thank you card said, thank you for talking honestly to my husband. And holding him accountable for how he spends our money. And that's accountability. And when we do that in love, and when we are open to receive that and not jump to, why are you judging me? 
God can do incredible things in our lives. He can do incredible things through us, and he can do incredible things in us when we are open to biblical accountability. I think another part of that, in addition to love, uh, an important aspect of that is encouragement. Uh, we need to be supportive and encouraging uh, to other folks that, that we're, if, if we are the person that's, that's make, making that accountability possible, we need to encourage and uh, do everything we can. And whenever something is achieved, hooray, celebrate, celebrate it, yeah. yes. There's not enough celebrating going on in churches today. We, we do need that. I mean, I'll tell you what, you know, when we look at um, baptisms and we look at people coming to know Jesus for the first time and people uh, recommitting their lives, I mean, this place needs to be a, a party place, you know, oh, yeah. when you think about it. Um, if, we, if we were, you know, in, uh, in line with Christ and, and living that life, there's a lot to celebrate, and we should really, as you say, do that as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of brings us to the end of chapter 12, and so next week we're going to actually be jumping into 13, and we're going to see Jesus washing his disciples' feet, and we'll go on from there. Um, you know, I think finishing up tonight, um, I wanted to kind of give a quick plug. Uh, over the next four months, uh, the pastors, and we're going to have a few guest speakers in here on Sunday morning as well, uh, we are going to be preaching a series called Knowing God. And one of the premises of preaching a series of Knowing God is the fact that uh, there's there's a big difference between knowing God and knowing about God. And so, you know, you look to your left and your right, and you know, I know Linda knows Richard. Richard knows Linda, you know, and probably way more than I might know about Linda or about Richard, but you guys know each other way more, right? And so when we think about our relationships with God, you know, how well do we really know God? And when we think about the characteristics of God, when we think about the attributes of God, when you think about as an adopted child of God, what that means, you know, what, what does that mean in your life? And so I'm looking really forward to it as, as we dive into it. Um, this Sunday, we're going to begin that series, and um, I, I pray that you guys would be praying for us as well. Uh, so uh, myself, Pastor Mark, Pastor Tim, uh, Jordan, who's upstairs, and uh, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, doing our best to press forward. Uh, Linda, the ladies, this weekend, I'm super excited for y'all uh, to, to get some women's ministry stuff going. And, and uh, now we just got to find some guys to get some guys' ministry stuff going. Uh, hint, hint, anybody watching? All right. And uh, so we're looking forward to, to a lot of things going. Uh, please be praying for all the teachers out there. Please, please, please be praying for the teachers out there. Uh, they, they've got quite a job ahead of them this year. And... Uh, there's a lot of parents out there that are nervous. There's a lot of people that, you know, whether they're sending their kids back to school, whether they're doing online, trying to balance all this stuff. These are uncharted times for our country. Uh, these are, I mean, just uh, people trying to figure things out with, with COVID still going on and everything. So please make that a matter of daily prayer as well. Um, and then, um, Mark, you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's great. Another prayer request came in. That's why I'm, that's why I'm on my phone. If y'all were wondering, why is that guy on his phone? I saw a prayer request come in from Sally Lee. I, I would like to pray for that tonight before we close. But, yeah, um, there's nothing more important in life than your relationship with God. And viewing God the way Jesus described him in this passage, he's our father. He, you know, Jesus, Jesus was very clear. And he always referred to him as the father. I have some praise team members, Paul and Aaron, and they always, whenever they talk about God, they say, you know, we're, we're uh, really seeking father's will on this. I love that because God is our father. And knowing him as the father and developing that intimate relationship with him will absolutely change your life. It'll change your perspective on everything that happens. And it will change, it'll change your ability to evangelize because now you're not telling someone about someone that you know about. Now you're sharing your relationship with your dear friend, with another dear friend. So I think this series is, is going to be life-changing for a lot of people when they cross that line from knowing about God to having an intimate relationship with him. In this uh, passage that we close in, this last verse here in, in verse 50, uh, Jesus says, I know his command is everlasting life. That was the key theme that God the Father desired for us, that we all, as many as would come to him, 
would have everlasting life with him forever and ever in a glorious relationship and a glorious play, place. And so it's our job to facilitate that as much as possible in, in whatever ministry the Lord gives us and whatever dedication we can muster through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to carry that out. You know, Scripture also says to know God is everlasting life. So I think that ties in beautifully to not only where we're at right here, but where we're going. Yep. So, exactly. you want to pray? Right, let me pray. Okay. Um, Sally requested prayer for uh, her grandson. So, God, we just lift up right now Sally's grandson who's uh, traveling back to New Mexico and Texas. Pray that you keep them safe on the road. And we also lift up her friend Audrey Brown who's having breast cancer surgery. And, Lord, we just pray that it goes well and that, Lord, that that cancer would be completely eradicated from her body. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the chance to dig into your word tonight, to be reminded of who you are, that you are a father to us to be reminded of the mission of Jesus, and that's to bring eternal life to everyone who will believe. God, I pray that you would just help us to embrace this teaching, God, and to live it out and to, to shine the gospel light to all of our friends and neighbors and coworkers. And God, I just pray that you would reap a great harvest in this city through us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a good night. <laughs>